Um, so the way we kind of structured this is that I'm going to talk kind of on a broad view of a number of crops and a number of diseases with a very sort of practical, pragmatic approach of what we as a seed company see and deal with and worry about the most. There are many, many, many other diseases that we are aware of but don't deal with too regularly. And so I'm going to kind of do a broad view, and then Lindsay's going to talk in more depth about the diseases um, of the Pacific Northwest and the crops that are most that are grown here for seed most uh, widely. So I think I can get this to work. Um, I did that same thing again. Okay. Um, and I'm going to give it, a, you know, that angle of for organics, you know, what, how we approach this for organic seed and how that's maybe a little different than conventional. Um, we don't have a lot of tools for preventive spraying. We have a few, but we really feel like with such a limited chemical toolbox and because that's not compatible as compatible with organics, um, we really want to prevent disease in every way that we can. And we only want to treat as a last resort. So we really feel like knowledge is our most powerful tool. And so every way that you can glean knowledge on the crops that you grow is going to be that much more valuable for preventing problems. Um, oh. oh, now I did something bad. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. So I'm going to do a little bit of... Um, basic biology here. I apologize to those of you for whom this is old hat, um, but I feel like for people who are new to this topic, it's really key that we have a little foundation in what the pathogens are because pathogens basically come in three flavors. Um, we have bacteria, fungi, and virus, and they're pretty different kinds of organisms. Bacteria and fungi are more similar to one another than either one is to viruses, um, but they're still pretty different from one another. Bacteria um, is an organism that has a very minimal cell wall. And so they don't tend to live on the outside of the plants. They have to stay moist. So they tend to live on the inside of the plants, traveling through the veins of the plant. And those we call systemic. What that means in a practical sense is that they're treatable on seed to some extent, but they're rarely treatable in the field because they're inside the plant. The fungi, which has a true cell wall can survive dry conditions, often is more on the outside of the plant. Not totally so, but in general. And that means that we can often treat fungi in fields. And we have options. We have less options on the seed itself than we necessarily do in the field. So uh, they're different in that way. Viruses are systemic like a bacteria. They tend to be, they're always inside the plant, but they're just not treatable anywhere. They don't tend to be as destructive as either bacteria or fungi, but you basically can't do much about them. You just really need to prevent them. Okay, a little bit on bacteria. I'm not going to read this whole slide. Um, this will be stored somewhere if anybody ever wants to look at this in any more detail. But I'm just showing here that bacteria are very simple cells with very soft cell walls. So they do live inside the plant. And I'm... Um, Basically, what I was just talking about, they're hard to stop in the field, um, but they and they tend to get into the center of the seed, much more so than fungi would. Um, however, they're more sensitive to heat, which makes them a little easier to treat on seed than most fungi or viruses. And these are some pictures of, this is just a schematic, um, a schematic of a cell, a bacterial cell. And this is actually... Xanthomonas campestris, the worst bacterial disease, um, what it, just what it looks like on a plate for those of you who've never seen a bacteria. This is, you know, millions and millions and millions of cells growing on a plate, on a petri plate. Fungi are much more comp are complex cells, unlike a bacteria with a hard chitin cell wall. They spread by spores, which are very tough, uh, very persistent. Um, they often still need water to move, but they um, can survive a while until they get the water they need to then colonize a new plant. And they tend to colonize the outside of the plants. Um, they're easier to set back. Oops, sorry. Um, they're easier to set back in the field because they're often on the surfaces. And they don't always get into the center of the seed. Some of them do, but some of them don't. Some of them just are sitting on 
the wall of the of the wall of the seed like this. This is uh, gray mold, Botrytis scenaria on a lettuce seed. Um, they're very distinctive. If you ever grow do a germ test in your kitchen and you see fuzzy seeds, that's a fungus. If you see slimy seeds, that may be a bacteria. Viruses won't look like anything. Um, funguses, fungi are, fu are furry. Okay. Uh, viruses really are not even alive. There's no cells. They are basically packaged DNA or RNA. So because they're not alive, you can't kill them. You can destroy them, essentially just pulverize them with enough heat and enough pressure. But if you're going to do that on a seed, you're also going to destroy your seed. So there isn't really a way to get rid of viruses without killing your seed. Um, they're often less devastating than some other than some other diseases. And for some crops in some locations, some low level of viruses aren't going to bother commercial growers all that much. Um, so we kind of walk a tightrope on viruses, but we're very careful on anything we're planting. The nice thing about them is there's now a number of strip tests for detecting them in seed by just crushing a little bit of seed and sticking a stick in it like a pregnancy test and you get a yes or no very quickly. Um, so we're very careful to not plant seeds that have, if we can, that don't, that have virus on them. This is your typical viral symptoms. You've all seen these. They all. It's very hard to distinguish viruses from one another in the field. It's very easy to say that's a virus. Very hard to say which virus that is, and that's where strip tests come in. Or if you really, in in general, because they're all treated the same, they're all handled the same. Um, once they're in a field, it's not really always that important to know what they are, but it's important to know. Um, as a seed grower, whether what you're dealing with is a, a seed-borne virus versus there's a number of them that are very insignificantly seed-borne. So that's where the strip tests are really valuable. Okay, so what do I need to worry about? Um, I kind of, we have so many diseases, it's overwhelming when you talk about the whole population of diseases. I tried to break this down in a way that was hopefully a little bit useful for people. The red alert are the ones that are just really a big problem. They're the ones that they're highly virulent, meaning once you get them, they're going to spread quickly. They're going to be very destructive. They're also highly seaborne. Then we have a whole category more of ones that I label as orange alert, meaning um, they can be one of two types. They can be moderately destructive and highly seaborne, or highly destructive but only moderately seaborne. Either one of those I sort of classify as this mid-level, mid-level worry zone. And then yellow alert diseases are those that are weakly destructive, weakly seed borne, and I won't talk about those in detail today, but really that's the big class. Um, there's a lot of diseases that you'll see in your fields that they can be soil borne diseases. Um, they can be just very prevalent, causing minimal damage. They're very common. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. These are very common because they don't kill the whole plant. So if they're not killing the plant, they're much more likely to let that plant make seed, and they're much more likely to move on to the next generation. So they're common. The really serious, really destructive diseases are not nearly as common because they kill their hosts. Luckily, there's only a small number of these really destructive diseases. Um, and the worst of these is the brassica disease, black rot, which you all know about. Um, black rot and black leg are both brassica diseases, both really destructive, both really seed borne. Black rot I consider worse just because it's so much more common. So it's a bacteria, um, Xanthomonas campestris, the same one we saw on the petri plate a little bit ago. Um, highly virulent, highly seed borne. It has the lovely distinction of being number one among the top 10 seed borne diseases. We get more and more and more questions about this from growers all the time. People are, are worried about black rot and they should be. Um, it spreads quickly in warm, humid weather. Um, it can take out a whole field really fast if it gets in there. And if you think about it, the fact that we ever see it on seed is a little strange because it's so destructive and it kills whole plants that how does that plant ever finish a seed? So any seed that's carrying black, lot, black rot came from a field where that disease had to come into the field pretty late in the season. So coming in late in the season when we already have seed heads is the only way that disease is then going to travel on. Um, so it's a, it's an odd strategy in a way for moving yourself around if you're a pathogen. 
Luckily, there's a new strip test for it. And this is really valuable to us because we can now test pretty much all uh, biennial brassica seed routinely. It either comes to us tested or we test for it. Um, it is sensitive to hot water as a bacteria, but it's the kind of pathogen that if you detected it, you wouldn't even bother. It's too risky. Um, symptoms are really distinctive. Unless you've never grown brassicas, you probably have seen this at some point. Um, it's really distinctive in being in the veins of um, in the mar veins of the leaf margin. It spreads very quickly. Um, this is a typical top view of a cabbage. Um, it's got that really distinctive, you know, lesions in a regular pattern at the at the tips of the veins, primarily at the veins, almost always at the margin. Okay, moving on to black leg. Um, this again, this now is a fungus. So black rot is a bacteria, black leg is a fungus. Um, this one is, you know, equally destructive and equally seaborne, but just not as common. Um, again, spreads quickly in warm, humid weather. It likes similar conditions. Um, it's not quite as explosive as black rot. It is sensitive to hot water treatment, but for the same reasons, if you detected it, you wouldn't really bother because it's just too dangerous. Um, symptoms of black leg are these canker stem cankers is really dis this distinctive feature, black leg canker stems. Um, they're typically at the base, and you can typically see these kind of black pycnidia. That's what kind of thing you would, is fairly diagnostic for that one. Again, restricted to brassica, so both of these. I'm going to kind of work on talking about diseases by crop category, and I'm just going to kind of hit the worst diseases for those crops, and I'm just going to hit a few crops here. Um, Here's some more black leg symptoms. Um, it's not quite as distinctive as black rot. I mean, this could look like alternaria, but you know that that stem feature is pretty diagnostic for it. Dark gray lesions. Um, moving on to lettuce. Um, lettuce has a lot of diseases, plenty of them, but the one that's really seed borne is LMB, and this is the one that everyone worries about, um, especially in California. We worry about it. It's a big deal for growers, and we um, it's a big deal for us in seed production because we have to decide which varieties we're going to sell as LMB tested, which ones matter to growers, which ones don't. In general, the head lettuces matter for being tested, and in general, the baby leaf lettuces don't matter as much. That's just the general category. They're more The head lettuces are generally tested. The baby leaves usually aren't. doesn't mean they're not that they have LMB, we often have them grown LMB free, but we don't sell them as tested. Um, again, highly virulent, highly seed borne, very common um, in this region in Oregon. It's very common at low levels, and it doesn't necessarily, until it gets to a certain severity, you can not even really notice it. But when it gets to a certain severity, it's definitely unmarketable, um, not as deadly. Um, symptoms, again, well, uh, virus symptoms look pretty similar, but in there aren't too many viruses in lettuce. So if you're seeing distinctive viruses, it's it's uh, it can get CMV, but LMB is more common in lettuce than CMV, I think. Um, and it, strip test is readily available. Nice thing about this one. More symptoms. Okay, moving quickly on to carrots. Um, carrots doesn't. I don't have any diseases for it that I would characterize as red alert, but it's got a whole bunch of these sort of mid-level seed-borne diseases. And um, one of them is bacterial, and a couple of them are fungal. And they're pretty similar in some ways. You probably know many more distinctive features about them, but from a very pragmatic view of somebody um, growing these in a field, they, they behave similarly in certain ways. Um, the bacteria, again, is Xanthomonas campestris. It's a different um, cultivar or different um, variety, the karate. Oops, sorry. Um, Xanthomonas is the same species name with a different, um, what's that called, PV? Huh? Pathivar. Pathivar, thank you. That's what PV stands for. Um, again, moderately, this one is moderately virulent, but very highly seed borne. Um, and it primarily, unlike black rot, which can just melt the whole field, it primarily causes yield losses due to poor seed germination. Um, it causes a blight on the leaves. The lesions will turn dark brown and shiny, and it can progress 
down the petiole and it'll end up in the seed and the seed, because it's not quite as destructive, it's much more likely to get into the seed because it's gonna let the plant make seed. And then that seed is gonna germinate poorly and have trouble the next season and it's gonna have that disease as soon as it comes up. Um, carrot, fungal blights are similar in certain ways. Um, there's two of them that behave similarly, alternaria blight and cercospor blight. Um, similarly, moderately virulent, they aren't gonna totally melt the whole plant quickly, but, um, and they're maybe a little bit less seed borne than the bacterial blight, but um, they can occur in the same field. Um, they're causing yield losses often due to leaf loss, um, but also can be due to destroying the quality of the seed. Um, Cercospora blight um, tend to have more round, better defined spots. Um, similar to Cercospora and beet, they're pretty distinctive and having that kind of black halo around a paler center. Um, Alternaria blights um, tend to be more irregular lesions in carrot, and they're typically on the margins. So, you know, you can sort of see, and these, pic these pictures are pretty good for kind of identifying that difference. These are maybe better pictures than these, but these are just sort of less regular spots. Um, but you're gonna have trouble in a field being sure which one it is. You're generally gonna take that and send it to your your extension person or try to get some help to figure out which one it is. Um, moving on to onion. Onion white rot is um, the one that uh, is sort of most worrisome on seed. And it's a funny one. Um, it's a fungus. It's the same sclerotinia sclerotium, sclero, sclerotiorum that we see on lettuce, we see in beans. Um, it's, a, it's got a really wide host range. Compared to all the ones I've talked about so far, this one is a much wider host range. Um, and it doesn't really actually travel on seed. You can have spores on your seed. But the bigger problem for this one in lettuce is that the sclerotia tend to look just like a lettuce seed. Um, they easily get mixed in because they look so similar. They're, you know, little black. They look like little black mouse turds. And um, they can easily get mixed in. And they can, those sclerotia can live a really, really long time. And they can persist in soil for up to 15 years. So that's where having white rot on an onion seed crop is really a big problem and you really want to not pass on the sclerotia. And this is a crop grown widely in this region. So um, here's some symptoms. It's that classic fluffy white fungus. And um, I think I have a picture. Yeah, once it progresses further along, you get the fluffy white fungus and then it starts to be joined by these knotty black little hard sclerotia that are really what are gonna travel on with the seed. Okay, moving on to tomato. Um, to, to, tomato perhaps has the distinction of having the most seedborne, problematic seedborne diseases. Um, TMV, the, the mosaic virus is, a, I characterize it as a red alert. It may be partly that I'm a tomato breeder and tomato breeders worry about this a lot, but growers worry about this too. Uh, if any of you have done been involved in plug tray operations and people not allowing anyone smoking in the greenhouse is all about TMV. And it's essentially the same virus as tobacco mosaic virus. Um, there's slight distinctions that a virologist would be able to identify, but for practical purposes, they're, they're essential. You can get it from tobacco onto tomato. Um, and this one is just so common. It's not going to kill your plants, but it's going to, um, I have pictures here. Um, it's highly virulent and your, your damage level can be, is really variable. You can have symptoms that are so mild you hardly notice them to having, all the way up to having simple symptoms that basically keep your plant from fruiting. Um, there's just a wide range of symptom levels. There's a good strip test available and that's really handy. Um, but it's really hard to get out of seed and so that's where preventing the spread of this one on seed is really important because it's really, really pervasive and really hard to get out. We've tilled in entire tomato, like a whole year's worth of tomato crops because we brought it in on seed in one crop and before we knew it, we'd spread it to every other tomato in our production fields and they all had to get tilled in. Um, it doesn't persist over winter, at least in our climate, but you basically can't get it out once you get it in and it's gonna be in your seed. Um, symptoms, uh, pretty variable. 
you sometimes see them on the on the fruit. You sometimes don't, but you'll always see them in the leaves and particularly in your young leaves. And this is really a disease worth scouting for. We see it on seed an awful lot these days, and it seems to be pretty prevalent. And a fair amount of it, I'll just say, right, is coming from like big tomato seed houses in California is where I've seen the most of it coming from because there's just so many varieties and there's so much seed and it's so hard to control this thing and it's so infectious that um, it's worth, if you're growing tomato for seed, it's worth testing your seed before you plant it. Um, I'll just, let me back up one second and say, that is basically our prevention method is we strip test all of our, all of our tomato seed that, um, that we're about to plant for a crop all gets tested, especially if we bought it. We make sure to test it. Um, but on our own, our own seed, we don't, we wouldn't test it unless we're, we have any reason to think there's symptoms, but we're always scouting for it carefully and we're very careful to keep it out of the fields. So this is one I definitely recommend doing preventive testing on seed. Um, bacterial diseases, um, I, I call these an orange alert diseases because um, they are pretty, they're moderately virulent, they're highly seed borne, they're just not quite as common. They're, you know, fairly common, but not as much as TMD, which is so common. Um, these could cause considerable damage, but especially in greenhouses, and especially bacterial canker is really considered almost a greenhouse disease. Um, the nice thing about these is, is doing a good job fermenting your seed really knocks these way back, and then they, hot water is really effective on these too. Um, canker symptoms, um, this is your classic bird's eye spot, a raised spot, um, a, pale, a pale spot compared to the other two. The other two are a dark spot. Um, bacterial spot is a dark raised spot. Um, it infects green fruit maybe a little more than the other two do, so this is kind of a really typical look for bacterial spot. Um, and then speck is a smaller spot, also dark. Um, you know, Looks like a speck. How about that? Um, and here's all three of them on one slide. You know, essentially, for your purposes as a seed grower, these are really essentially almost the same because um, if you have one, you know, they're they're not really treatable in the field. They're treatable on seed. Um, you may, want, you know, it's good to know which one you have because there might be things you can do to prevent it slightly differently, but they're very similar pragmatic purposes. Um, their leaf and stem symptoms are very similar. Their fruit, so if you really do want to tell them apart, the fruit is the place to, to, to do that diagnostic, diagnostics because they're more different on the fruit than they are on the leaves. So um, you have a disease in your seed crop. So you're going to, you know, as seed growers, we scout and we scout and we scout. But what are your scenarios if you find one, if you find a disease? Um, what's your responsibility? So really, your first prim primary responsibility is just to be looking, looking for them, and then finding out what they are. Um, and to some extent, you know, if it's a crop you've grown a long time, you'll know right away. If it's something you haven't seen before, your job is to get the help you need to figure out what it is. Um, and that's where extension, um, most states have a, a, a lab you can send samples to. Um, these labs, you know, in general are just great to connect with and know that person and, you know, our, our state di um, lab person at UVM is just so responsive and helpful. And she, off, you know, in our lab, I don't know how it is in everybody's state lab. In our lab, she diagnoses down to genus, not really to species. For our purposes, that's generally enough, but we, you know, it's asking a lot to get a species definition, yes, a species diagnosis in our state lab, but that's okay, you know. Um, and then once you determine what it is, you would generally, if you're growing seed on contract, you would generally would consult with your seed company to make your next choices. Um, so your first scenario is that it's not a seed-borne disease. You have a disease, but it's not going to travel on your seed. So you really, at that point, you have the option to treat and keep your plants alive and go ahead and harvest your seed. This is true of something like late bite. You know, it's just not a seed-borne disease. Um, so there's, you know, a whole bunch of these that I'm not talking about today. Um, but it's good. Once you've figured that out, you're going to, that's that's a nice relief. Um, but then there's a whole bunch of these ones that I didn't talk about in detail today, but that are low virulence diseases, something like early blight in tomato. It can travel on seed a little bit, but um, it isn't, it's not significantly seed borne. 
It can be treated. Um, but basically all tomato crops have some early blight and we don't worry about that too much um, because it's just, there's so much early blight everywhere all the time that what little bit that might travel on seed is just a completely insignificant drop in the ocean. Um, but, um, and then, you know, there are some spot disease, bacterial spot diseases in tomato or pepper that if you had it at a really low level in your crop and they're very treatable by hot water, you might make the call with your seed company to go ahead and harvest that crop. But that is the exception. Um, for most seedborne diseases, you're going to destroy the crop and that's just really where you're at. Um, you don't want to spend any more time on it and then have the seed company test it and reject it. You know, at that point, everybody has to make a decision about cutting their losses but it has to be saleable seed. Um, and again, preventing the spread by seed is just really our key number one strategy for organics. Um, so, but if you do have something that can be treated with seed, and there are a few of these, we've done this. Um, occasionally, cucurbit scab is one that we've seen that's really kind of can travel on seed, but it's such an insignificant amount compared to what's available, what tends to be in soils and fields around us that we will decide, okay, we'll harvest and treat. Um, We've done that maybe once. Um, but we really only have a couple options. Um, hot water and bleach are our two main options. We're always trying to, you know, find something else that might be effective. And so far to date, I don't really have much to say. I've tried a bunch of things that don't work very well. Um, but these two work relatively well. Of the two, hot water works a lot better. Um, if it's a crop and all the small seeded crops can be hot water treated, um, it's by far the most effective. And I, you know, have done side by side studies of diseased lots, you know, with a whole bunch of different things and hot water just hands down works the best. Um, it, what it does is that it kills the disease on the outside and the inside of the seed because you're penetrating with heat and it can really fully eradicate heat sensitive pathogens. I've seen it work really well on, um, rhizopis in a uh, rhizoctonia in lettuce, um, which is one of these sort of can be seed borne. It's not that devastating because it's so soil borne um, that heat treatment can be a really nice uh, cleanup for that. It works perfectly. You won't, don't have any more disease. Um, the disadvantages of it are that it does require some kind of investment. Um, you have to handle it very, you have to do it carefully because you can damage seed if you add too much heat. And you can't do it during harvest. So if you're going to be heat hot water treating, you're basically going to dry your seed and then re-wet it to do your hot water treatment and then dry it again. So you just need to be set up to do that. It's not that hard. It's just something you have to plan for. Um, the requirements, um, 42 to 50, I've done these sort of experiments. 42 for most diseases works as well as 50 and you take less risk of damaging seed. Um, there are some diseases that are a little borderline for being killed by heat and you might want a little bit higher temperature for those, but most of them, 42 Celsius, which is 118 Fahrenheit, works really well. 15 to 25 minutes, again, if you're worried about damaging your seed, you might go to the lower end of the range, but most seed does fine at 25 minutes. Um, the way we do this is really just, we don't do large scale hot water treatment. We would only, we generally do small, small lots. Um, and we typically use just muslin cotton bags that you can buy as parts bags. You put your seed in the bag, you put the whole thing in, hot water treat it, um, and then you take the whole thing out and you dry it in the bag. And so you get dry seed and then you get the dry seed out of the bag. That's just the easiest way to do it. Trying to get wet seed out of a vessel is really hard. Um, you, need, you need some kind of temperature control on whatever kind of a operation you set up. You, I don't recommend doing this on a stovetop with the thermometer. You just really take a big risk of damaging seed. Um, your budget option is a deep fryer. You know, these you can buy pretty well, these turkey deep fryers that are designed for oil, but they have a thermostat. You can just put water instead of oil and they can work pretty well. Um, the better option, if you're going to be doing a fair amount of it, is to get a lab grade water bath, which you can buy on eBay, eBay for as low as 150 bucks, and it won't damage your seed. Um, this is what our shaking water bath looks like. It's just your typical shape. Every single lab in the world has these. They're pretty, really very common. And the, um, I don't know if you can see the thermometer on here, but the thermometer just goes, oh, there it is. This is the thermometer. It goes right, or this is the holder for it. it goes right, at, this gets filled with water. Um, put the thermometer in there. When it gets up to temperature, you turn on the shaker. The whole thing shakes, and you put your muslin bags, your cotton bags full of seed in there. You shake it for your 15 to 25 minutes. Then you take them out, dry the whole thing. 
pretty simple. Um, okay, um, bleach. Uh, this one is really the only option for large seeded crops. If you happen to have a large crop, you can't hot water treat those. They just don't do with that. So bleach is your one option. This is what we, you know, we've used this on cucurbit scab um, maybe one other time. It's fast. It's easy. You can do it during harvest. That's the real advantage. Um, you can do it while you're washing, while you're rinsing your wet seeded crops. You can add some bleach to your rinse water at the end, and that's really handy. Um, it won't ever totally eradicate disease from your seed, but it'll knock it way back. Um, it's the only organic option for large seeded crops. The main disadvantage is that it doesn't completely eradicate anything. And it's going to damage your seed coat. It can damage your seed coat. Generally, it will damage your seed coat. It won't necessarily cause irreparable damage. It just makes it look, you'll get cracks on your coat and they'll sort of look bad. You know, it's still saleable seed, but you don't want to like do this routinely. That's what I'm getting at because your seed won't look so pretty. Um, and it doesn't reach the inside of the seed. It's only for the seed coat. So it really is only applicable to fungi. You wouldn't try to use this for bacterial disease. Um, the requirements would be a 5 to 10% bleach solution, usually 5 to 10 minutes. Um, and as I said, you can add it to your final wash. Um, there's a few other things I've tried. I've actually tried, I don't have a very good list here. I've tried Storox. I've tried a whole bunch of other things that you would think might be antifungal because you use them, you spray them on your crops. But on seed, I haven't seen them work really at all. You know, they don't really look any different than controls. Um, so. Right now, we don't have good tools to try other things. Um, and they certainly wouldn't be appropriate for anything really virulent. And um, so this is going to be saved um, on the, um, so if, if anybody's interested in um, these resources, I will point out, I don't know if I find it on here, um, the very best text is this Canadian Diseases and Pests of Vegetable Crops in Canada. Um, this is, I say this over and over, but really this is the best overall book for vegetable diseases with tons of information on life cycles and control and pictures. And really, um, it's from 1994 is the latest edition, and we really could use a new one, and we could use a U.S. version. It's out, And it's out of print now, really. That's terrible news. Really? None? Really? That's a, not a bad idea. Oh. Uh. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a bummer. Oh. We have any of our Canadian seeds people here? You guys lobby your Canadian pathologic. It's the title is um, "Diseases and Pests of Vegetable Crops in Canada." It's. Well, it's put, no, it's put out by the Canadian Pathological, Phytopathological Society. And it's, it's really a really remarkable work. You know, it's really um, very thorough. Huh? It's 20 years old. Yeah, it's really, we're, you know, needs to be revised. And we really, it would be wonderful to have an American version because it, it, it doesn't cover any diseases of southern U.S. It's all very much diseases of the north. So um, that's all I have. There's online resources. These will all be stored with this talk, and that is all I have. So thank you.